Welcome uh, everybody to the, this is the fourth talk in the Sarah Little Turnbull Design Speaker Series. Uh, thanks for coming. Today we're gonna be talking to Clavon Lowe. It's uh, my honor to welcome him to Lehman College uh, as part of this uh, series. Uh, Mr. Lowe is the uh, founder of D Brand Designs. He's based in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which I believe is where you are right now. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Yep. So thank you for coming. Uh, he's also the at-large director of awards for the Industrial Designer Society of America's Board of Directors. And he is also the co-chair of the IDSA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today as part of the larger theme of diversity and inclusion for this, uh, for this talk for this series. Um, Clavon is an innovative designer. He's an entrepreneur and he has a determination to problem solve through design. He also creates custom automotive concepts under his own dbrand design studio. And uh, he's also work, he also works as the hard lines design and development lead for Lowe's Home Improvement. I'm really- Actually, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a green, I'm a senior industrial designer at Green Tech's Home now. Oh, okay. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to have him here today. And uh, let's get started. I, like I said, Clavon, I, I did want to um, talk about your role uh, in the IDSA's Diversity and Inclusion Council. I want to talk all about those, uh, those things. But I thought maybe we could just start by telling us a little bit about how you even got into design. Okay. Um, I put together a few slides. I know we yeah. talked a little bit earlier. I put together a few slides. Great. And what I want to talk about, I, I want to go through like my path to becoming a designer, um, some of the things I've created as a designer, where design has taken me, okay. some of the opportunities that uh, design has afforded me. And then I'll start to um, get a little um, into uh, race and contemporary design or culture and contemporary design, as I like sure. to call it. So I have a few slides that'll, um, that'll lead us into the discussion um, okay. that you and I look to have. So yeah. um, I'll share my screen. Uh, and while Clavon's doing that, if anybody has any questions uh, for anything that you're, that you're looking at it on the screen or anything that we're talking about, please feel free to just put them in the Q&A panel. You'll find that down at the very bottom bar on the screen and we'll do our best I guess to answer them as we're we're talking because we like to have everyone to be part of the, the conversation all right is my, my screen up yep I see your screen you are all set to go okay so my name is Clavon Lowe um, I'm from originally from Stoneville North Carolina my middle name is Duran Lowe and uh, is Duran and I, as a kid I was known as Duran but this is a story that I wrote in the uh, second grade about what I wanted to be when I grew up. So growing up, I actually wanted to be a truck driver. Um, my dad is a truck driver and has been my uh, entire life. And I knew nothing about design. Um, I actually just loved to, to draw trucks. And I, I started out drawing trucks for my dad. Um, my parents divorced when I was a young kid. So I was set around about seven in the uh, second grade and I would draw um, trucks for my dad. When he came in on the weekend, I would give him uh, drawings of his truck. Um, and that's how I started drawing trucks and cars and motorcycles. And my dad also wrote motorcycles. So art was a thing that I did to sort of um, like make my dad proud when he came in off the road. So, um, so this is, again, like I say, this is a story I wrote, and then this is a a, um, a note that my mom left in my yearbook as a senior in high school, um, and it just says, you know, I was very smart and handsome. I don't know if I still am, but, uh, you know, the note says to stay positive and pursue your dreams. Always remember to keep God first, and you can achieve your goals and be anyone that you want to be. So um, this is like my my fueling force throughout my life I feel like and as I go through my story you'll see how a lot of things come together just based off of this story that I wrote uh, in the second grade. Um, I told you my parents divorced when I was uh, seven and I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house. So this is my grandmother's house where I spent most of my time at, and it was located in front of this airport um, 
that you see in the Google map in the bottom left corner. So in the evenings, my mom worked second shift and in the evenings I would go in and uh, sit out in a tree and watch airplanes take off and watch jets take off. And um, I, uh, I would go in the house and practice drawing. You know, once, once the sun went down, I would go in and, and draw and, and um, perfect my craft as some would say. And I didn't learn about design. Um, I didn't learn about industrial design until I was in college. But when I was in high school, my um, high school art teacher told me that I should look into architecture at NC State. So I applied for design school at NC State and I got accepted and off I went. So I started design school in uh, 1999. Um, my freshman year, my mother passed away on Christmas Eve. So um, at that time I, I was in architecture and I, I realized that architecture really wasn't um, what I wanted to do. And I just so happened to stumble across the ID studio. Um, and as you can see, I was pretty happy to be in the ID world once I, once I found it. Um, and while, while at State, I, uh, I was a member of, of IDSA. Um, um, I was the president of the African American Design um, Students Association. And I really uh, enjoyed my time in, 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 in school and uh, I had a lot of fun, as you can see here. Um, still into motorcycles like I was as a kid, but- um, Where do I get one of those? That's what I want to Oh man, I, they may have outlawed it now. Yeah, I think so. People yeah. got to uh, skin up on them. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, after, uh, while, while it stayed, as I mentioned, I was a member of IDSA and I went to uh, several IDSA conference where I, conferences where I, I uh, landed internships. And uh, I'll get into a little bit into my career now. Um, my first internship I landed was with CCI and some folks know it as TTI, but they design and develop the tools for Home Depot and at the time Sears. So we were working on Craftsman, Rigid and Ryobi tools. And uh, these are some of the, uh, the tools I designed as an intern back in 04. Um, and then my, my second job, which I also landed at an IDSA conference, uh, I landed an internship was with Kids2, uh, which is a toy company down in um, Atlanta, Georgia. So I started Kids2 in 2005 as an intern and, and, and they brought me on full time. And here are a few images from my Kids2 days. Um, it was sort of really a unique experience being like this black urban guy going to the club and all of that. And then people ask you what you do for your living and you tell them you design baby toys and they give you this look like you got to be kidding me, right? And I'm like, no, I'm really a toy designer. So I was like, the real life big is what people would call me once they figured out, um, found out what I did for a living. Um, after I left uh, Kids 2, I joined Lowe's where I've um, had the opportunity to do a lot of uh, great things. Um, I, I started off in lighting and I, I worked on lighting, kitchen and bath products, and uh, had a lot of great experiences while working with Lowe's. Um, here's a, here are a few of my sketches that I um, did there. I designed the, the uh, this Mary Mac fan is one of my favorite. It's still sold at Lowe's and it's like one of the top fans at Lowe's. It's been in Lowe's probably for 10 years now, but it's one of my favorite items. Um, I also designed um, a lot of lighting collections. I put this piece in here because um, I'm not a big fan of plants, but this botanical trend forced me to um, get in touch with my um, uh, botanical side with my green thumb, and uh, I had to design a collection with, uh, with leaves on it. So um, it allowed me to get in touch with my, um, my natural side, I guess my country boy side. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like I said, I also designed some, uh, uh, a few faucet collections for Lowe's under their Aquasource brand. Um, so I, look, I work a lot on Aquasource and Allen and Roth. Um, after I, I, I was the uh, design and development lead for Allen and Roth, I had a chance to work on some uh, cobalt tools. So I led design and development for Cobalt Tools. Um, when I left, when I left Lowe's, that was the position I was in. 
I was the design, the design and development lead for Cobalt Tools. But while working for Cobalt Tool under Cobalt Tools, I developed um, power tools, outdoor power equipment, lighting, handheld, handheld tools, mechanics tools. I mean, you name it, up tile saws. Um, I have a ton of Cobalt Tools scattered about my house. Um, but I think the one thing about industrial design and design in general is just coming from uh, the background that I come from, it has just allowed me some amazing opportunities um, and experiences throughout my life. So um, I've had a chance to go around the world a few times um, with design. So I've been to uh, Mexico, um, got to experience that culture there for a little bit. I've been to China a few times. This is me in, in a factory in mainland China. Um, here I am in Hong Kong, um, you know, experiencing that culture. And then here I am, you know, just a good old country boy from North Carolina at a Victoria's Peak um, in Hong Kong. So I'm not sure if you can pick up on my accent, but I'm not from New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of one of my most amazing experiences while working at Lowe's was uh, designing this chopper for cobalt tools. So you know a little bit of my backstory, and you know that I grew up drawing motorcycles and and um, you know in front of this airport where uh, at my grandmother's house. But you know one one day they came to me and they told me, "Hey, we want you to design this uh, chopper for us." And I was thinking to myself, like, what is Lowe's gonna do? Are they gonna sell choppers in the store? You know, I, I really didn't understand at the time. And then when they sat me down in the meeting, they were like, no, we're doing a, a promotional bike with Orange County choppers in New York and we want you to work on it. So um, I came home and I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm gonna work on this chopper for every, every night when I come home for a week and I'm gonna do this thing. So I finally drew everything out and then we sent the drawings up to uh, OCC and they built the bike. And then I had the chance to go up and be on the, um, the show with Paul Senior and the team. So here I am on the show at the unveiling um, of the chopper. But I think one of the, the greatest, one, another great experience for me was actually flying on a jet to go to watch the unveiling. So, you know, I grew up in this small house in front of this airport where private jets came in and out on the daily and I never knew what was going on. And then to go from, uh, you know, drawing motorcycles in the evening to actually designing the motorcycle that put me on a jet and flew me to New York for the unveiling on a TV show was like, you know, a dream come true for me. So um, that uh, inspired me to create uh, D brand designs, which is, as you heard, where I create um, custom automotive uh, concepts in my um, studio at home. So I do a lot of trucks and a lot of um, cars and motorcycles for people. So here's here's one of my recent uh, Harley, custom Harley Davidson concepts that I created with one of my friends. Um, he owns a, a custom Harley Davidson shop. So I created this for a client who's a big Alabama um, football fan. And then uh, we ended up building it. And then this is my son, uh, daddy's little man in front of the um the alabama bike that we built um and it's won a few awards in daytona and, and around and uh car shows around the um south and then i also do uh the what's called a log book sketch if you if you go to my website you'll see um um i create these custom log book sketches for these truckers so just this shows you a little bit about um you can see some of the progress from my sketches from the second grade to now, right? So I've been drawing trucks since I was in the second grade and now I do it um, in my spare time. I do a lot of it for people across the country who found me through Instagram and uh, they uh, commissioned me to do the drawings of their trucks, whether it's on logbook sketch um, and also do some uh, custom concept work for show trucks that are built um, by some of my clients across the country. So. This is one of them. So this is a well-known trucking company in Wisconsin. They build show quality trucks and they also work them too. So they commissioned me to create a concept sketch for a truck that they wanted to build. So this is a 
a digital rendering that I created for them um, before they built the truck so they could see what it looked like. And it's won like the top show, top awards across the country. Um, so going back to my story from the second grade. So, um, you know, I told you about the story uh, that I wrote when I was a kid. And uh, in 2017, I had the opportunity to invest with my dad to buy his own tractor trailer. So, um, so the funny thing is all the places I wrote about in this story in the second grade, he went to all those places on his first trip out. So, um, so it was pretty amazing. So um, a lot of times you'll see me say um, that I'm living the dream and also say, if you look over my shoulder, I have a poster that says the dream is free and the hustle is sold separately. So um, design has afforded me the opportunity to, to live out a lot of my dreams. Um, this is a truck that I actually bought for myself and I actually hired someone to, um, to drive it for me. And then this is my dad's truck and my truck um, uh, at my house. So at this time, I'll shift gears a little bit and go into uh, race and contemporary design, or as I like to call it, culture. But I think I, when I think of race and contemporary design, I think it's more a lot to do with culture. Yeah. So um, I'll start out with uh, one example. Um, so most most people in the bike world um, know this bike. I mean, this is the most iconic chopper in the history of chopper motorcycles. Um, this is called the Captain America chopper. It was featured in Easy Riders uh, magazine, uh, not Easy Rider magazine, the Easy Rider movie, which um, premiered in 1969. It was one of the top four um, grossing movies of the year. And it basically started this, this big movement with custom choppers. Um, and it was, you can see Peter Fonda here riding in the movie. And for the longest, people um, were under the assumption that Peter Fonda actually uh, designed and built this bike. This bike recently auctioned for $1.2 million. It sold at an auction for $1.2 million. Wow. Um, but the backstory is this bike was actually designed and built by two black guys on the West Coast, um, Clifford Voss, who you see here, and another guy by the name of um, Ben Hardy. So these guys weren't given credit because of, they were black in 1969. They weren't given credit for pretty much anything um, because of, of their race. Um, and it took them 25 years to even be uh, recognized. Uh, the reality is a lot of um, guys on the, the West Coast, a lot of uh, black guys on the West Coast were building choppers at the time. And it was something that was um, pretty popular there. And when they brought them the bikes, they actually chopped the bikes up and built them the way they, they built the bikes that they were riding. And it, when it hit the the uh, the big screen, it just became an instant hit. Uh, but for the longest, these guys um, were these guys were pretty much unknown of, unheard of. Um, fast forward to uh, 2010. So I like to, when, as you know, I'm big into automotive design. And I've, I've paid really close attention to automotive design and and where it's gone and and uh, one of the big influences on on car culture is hip hop you know if you listen to hip hop you hear a lot of uh of the lyrics I often talk about cars or motorcycles or cash or it's like a a clout thing right so this this hip hop culture so i wanted to take a look and just share with you like where hip hop and uh, um has influenced uh the car culture in modern day right so um, in 2010, in 2008, I had a sports bike, right? So I had a Kawasaki Ninja, but I got a, um, in 2010, I, I received a phone call from one of my best friends and, uh, he told me, he, he said, Hey man, you need to watch this, uh, Rick Ross video. It's super high, man. They're, they're building these Harleys, man. We, we got to get Harleys. You know, this is, this is in 2010 and they had these customized Harleys with, um, and they were built on the West Coast and they had 21 inch wheels, 23 inch wheels and 26 inch wheels. And it was like the debut of this new look that, that was happening 
and Harless. So this video was directed by a uh, famous director, F. Gary Gray. And uh, this is F. Gary Gray on the left uh, riding his custom road glide. But in 2012, um, Harley uh, created a campaign called Iron Elite. And the Iron Elite campaign was actually to showcase the history and inspiring stories of custom bikes um, within the African-American community. So if you go back to the Captain America bike, it's, it's like Harley caught wind of it and was like, hey, you know, we need to really recognize what's going on within this race, within this culture, with this, um, with these bike builders. And for the longest, it's been said that that Harley was using um, uh, paint schemes that were created by a guy on the, uh, an African-American guy on the West Coast um, who's, who's a big time custom bike painter um, on the West Coast. So in 2012, they created um, the Iron Elite campaign. They used it to market um, the bikes and it was like a road tour. Um, they created the road tour across the country with Iron Elite riders and they created the patch. And on the patch is my good buddy, um, David Rose, um, who we call Big Swole, but he was like the, the first Iron Elite patch um, created by Harley Davidson to celebrate um, African-American riders, right? So, and just to show you, I'm gonna show you a visual um, here of how that culture influenced, you know, Harley Davidson, like, and, but you don't know it because there's so many subtle things that you see happening in cars and, and motorcycles that you don't really pay attention to. So the, if, in the upper left-hand corner is the 1990, um, uh, I believe it was called the Tour Glide, um, which is now the Road Glide. But in 2000, the Road Glide had a 16-inch wheel. In 2010, you see the introduction of an 18-inch wheel. And then in 2020, you can now buy it with a 21-inch wheel. And if you notice, um, another feature on the um, 2020 is the speakers. So you have like this sound system thing um, and that's big within custom Harley culture now is these uh, sound off series where they're putting eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch subwoofers into these bikes and just building these big audio competitions with, with all this music blaring on motorcycles, right? So um, just, that's within the motorcycle community. And I just finished another motorcycle. I just finished my personal motorcycle with um with a custom serial system and a big 21 inch wheel on it. So I'll show you another piece that I'm working on um shortly. So back to hip hop. And now we look at hip hop in the car world. And uh, you know, 99, I started NC State in 1999. I, I graduated with my undergrad in 2003. So during that time, you see um, small uh, rap guys like Lil Troy, who had a song, and with the, in the song, uh, the lyrics say, you know, I want to be a baller, I want to be a shot caller, 20 inch blades on the Impala, right? So there was this big movement towards uh, 20 inch rims, and uh, 22 inch rims, and 24 inch rims, and the big timers, uh, we're talking about 24 inch rims on Escalades and things like that. And this is a video that they created in 2003. Um, so now I'll show you um, the Escalade, right? So in, es in 1999, the Escalade came out with 16 inch wheels and Cadillac was pretty much like the, uh, you know, uh, a vehicle for um, an older generation, you would think. And then in 2015, it had 2005, it had 17 inch wheels. And then in 2007, now you can get the 22 inch wheels that you were seeing, you know, four years ago and in rap videos they are now on uh, the Cadillac Escalade. So um, that that's where I've really seen like hip hop play a role in car culture and what what companies are doing, it's almost like these artists have promoted the prototypes for the next generation of cars. And then once they become mainstream and acceptable, um, you know, they start releasing these updated designs. But I think to, um, to that point, you know, um, 
it's like uh, as an industrial designer, one of the things you do is you you research the trends within product categories and you see what's happening and you allow the trends to influence your designs, um, so to speak. And I think that when you look at the hip hop culture, it is truly influenced designs, especially when it comes to automotives and automotive design and, and bikes. But um, the, the question is like, when do you start bringing people of those cultures to the table yeah. to take part in the development? And, um, and you know, it's the, the unique thing about now is that you can either bring them to the table or people are gonna start creating their own table. So um, I, mean, I do yeah, wanna, yeah. I do wanna share, with that being said, I do wanna share, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and, and show you guys something. Okay. Um, and I, I, show, I shared this with you, David, but just yeah. as far as like bringing things to the table, like um, like when I did the bike with, um, with OCC, I didn't, my name was nowhere in the credits of the show or anything like that. And they actually held my drawing up and asked, you know, who did this, this drawing? And, you know, it was just a blanket statement. You know, we did it, you know, we had a team in North Carolina who created his drawings or whatever, but I took it upon myself to create my own uh, studio to where I can, you know, design and develop my own concepts and not yeah. really have to ask for permission or ask someone to allow me the opportunity to do it. And then, so I've been working on these custom bikes and then I also have a custom chopper that I'm building in my studio now. So, so um, is that, is that, is that painted or is that like a stainless um, look on it? Like what's it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, just bare metal now. And I'm thinking about going with a, a patina finish on it. Okay. And then after, after looking, you know, I've been thinking about doing like a, a patina captain in America, mm -hmm. uh, just as like a, um, a tribute to, oh the, you know, the boss and Hardy, just like a patina captain America pro street chopper. So, so you, to be um, clear, you, you designed the cobalt bike. You went all, they flew you all the way to, to orange County choppers, which is like in orange County, New York. Yeah. And then they, they asked like who designed this bike and the team said that it, that whoever was there said that a team designed it, not you. Is that no? They when they were filming the show, so they they had like a couple of meetings beforehand where they filmed the show, and then they showed my drawings, and then the team. And it's probably due to you know confidentiality um, sure. agreements or whatever in place then. But I think with with uh, today's um, you know today's the opportunities that exist today. Yeah. like for people to do their own things right. i think that it's it's becoming a time where people are going to have to start giving people and cultures and 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 different races credit yeah what they're doing because if not they can easily go out and create their own now so it's yeah. like you either get with diversity or you you like you you lose um you're gonna lose because you know yeah every, everybody has you know can create their own now you know so I think that it's, I mean, I definitely see how, how culture specifically like hip hop culture has influenced much of, much of the automotive industry. It's influenced clothing, sneakers, uh, which I guess is like within the realm of clothing, but how much do you think, or are you, or are you concerned at all that this is more like pandering to that audience, you know, versus empowering them and giving them this seat at the table like where does that lie yeah I, I think I, and i think there's a thin line between like pandering and really you know allowing a seat to the table but i think yeah. that with 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 everything that's going on now with, you know with, with black lives matter movements and all that i think that people are more aware to are you just pandering with us or are you really a lot you know affording us opportunities to do things i think people are more aware of what's what's happening now mm -hmm. and people are being held accountable for um being more diverse and inclusive so yeah it's we were having a discussion the first uh talk in this series we were talking about how with La laura silva from make america we were talking about how now businesses corporations, institutions are all kind of scrambling yeah. right, to become diverse, to become inclusive, 
to, to make diverse hires, to have people who are in charge of diversity, right? And that, that had never really happened in quite the same way before. And it's in much the same way that like a lot of things during the pandemic have accelerated, accelerated everything by like 10 years forward faster than it would have been. I feel like that's happening too, that businesses are scrambling to kind of patch up the non-diverse holes that they have. Right. And, you know, and my concern with that is, though it's laudable, it's really great that it's happening and then it's in the ether. My concern is how much of that is just also sort of pandering or, or posturing, or even just in a sense, part of like branding rather than substantive changes to the actual corporate and institutional structures in this in this country. Yeah, and I, I think the key too is like actually empowering people who are part of these these communities and cultures and races. Like you have to empower them and, and give right. you know sort of hand them the reins to to do um, you know do what they do because they know they're a part of it. It's like mm -hmm. like that's the inclusivity, right? Like you have to let them do what they do within their community because they know um, what's going on and they live it, right? Yeah. So. Um, and I think that's that's just the key to it, you know. With with IDA, with IDSA, you know, we have um, individuals on our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion council who are members of different communities. And one of the things we want to do is like empower them to, you know, go and and do what they do within their community. And we support that, you know, what they're what what they're trying to do, because. The, the beauty of diversity is you're you're an expert of what you're an expert of. You can't speak for other people. You know, you can't like you're not an expert of somebody else's life. So that's the beauty of like listening to other people and understanding and then empowering them to um, uh, make the changes that, they, that need to be made within the community, you know. I mean, and, that doesn't sound all that different from what a designer traditionally does, right? I mean, no designer is going to, you know, come up with the solution that works for her. They're going to, you know, she's going to do research and ideation and brainstorming and also user testing. Right. So, I mean, tell me about that. What kind of like, what's your experience with user testing with the products you've designed? So, it, you know, it's, um, I think one of, one of my, um, best examples of user testing and and, and it, it's just like uh it's like with with any uh you know when you're looking at demographics and you're looking at different groups of people um when i worked at the toy company mm -hmm. um and you can look at this sort of like the relationship between corporations and the people that are they're trying to support right the, the people they're trying to support so but not as literal okay so one of the things we always did was we always um, we always did focus groups with uh, parents because the parents were buying the toys, right? Right. right. And uh, I challenged the research team one one day. I was like, "Hey, we need to bring babies into the the, the building to see what toys they want. Like, has anybody like done a study with babies?" They're like, oh no, we can't do that because of liability. You know, right. we got insurance issues. We, yeah. I'm like, listen, we need to do a study with babies. Mm -hmm. So um, at the time, I created the toy. I called it the Caterballer, right? The hip hop and me had to call had to call it a baller because right. you know I've been listening to Lil Troy, right? <laughs> so um, the concept was called the Caterballer, and um, don't spit out your tea. I hope yeah. that's sweet. Um, it's it's but, not sweet. It's not sweet. I'm from New York. We don't drink sweet tea up here. But um, I, so the concept was called the caterballer, but it was just a, a basic uh, a basic um, toy. It was it had a caterpillar going around the outside and it had a ball on the inside. And I figured that kids would like really get a kick out of trying to get the ball out of the inside. Yeah. And they were like, you know, no one's ever going to buy this thing. Like it doesn't have lights. It doesn't have sound. And um, I was like, we need to get babies and um, we need to get babies in to review these toys, you know, just so we went and bought a whole bunch of toys and we bought a, a, a clutch ball and we threw all these toys out on the floor. And then the kids started playing with these toys. So they immediately went to this clutch ball. And I mean, there were like seven to eight month old kids about to fight over a clutch ball. Right. And then um, 
So I was like, that's it. That's that's proof that kids really love this this ball idea. So they're like, okay, you're right. So um, we developed this caterball toy, and we ended up calling it the Bendy Ball. And the toy was released in 2008, and it's one of their best selling toys. Um, and it's been in production since then. And it's if you go on Amazon, I want to say it has like 4,000 reviews wow. for the Bendy Ball or something. Last time I checked. But um, it's it's a bestseller, and we we came we we were um, you know we had the idea was proven through um, through user research with the people who actually use it, like the people who actually um, on the ground using the toy. And it's the same thing with you know diversity and and inclusion. Like in order to understand um, people, you have to understand and listen to what yeah. they're they're going through, you know, what they're dealing with. Um, and um, yeah, I think that was like, and that was like my my most eye opening user yeah. experience. I mean, that's yeah. shocking. It's shocking to me that a, a business that hires in in house designers would never think to, you know, to do that. Like it had yeah. to be like it had to be like mentioned and then discussed before it would even occur. Yeah, I mean, and, and, saying, and you know. the the beauty of it is like I was I was given the the opportunity or they empowered me to actually. Yeah. expand upon it right and it's just going back to like inclusion like empowering people to expand upon the issues or of course yeah. to explore you know I, um i have a, a question actually from one of the attendees that relates to this uh and then i kind of want to talk about the idsa and in, in your role okay that. but it, the question is being a black male in, in a mainly dominated white industry slash community were there any challenges you faced that made you second guess yourself as an artist? And uh, as a follow up, could you, if you could go back in time, would you do anything differently? Um, I don't. I don't think I ever second guess myself as an artist. You know, I showed you a story yeah. from you know the second grade. So my my parents always pushed me and believed in me, and like I was like the first generation college kid so I had a lot of people like pushing me and yeah and encouraging me to keep going and then when my mom passed my brother is 18 months younger than I am and I knew I had to graduate because it's like I know I have somebody looking up to me so I couldn't quit you know I've always been determined yeah. um and you know it's to to create my own um path um uh I, I I can't say I ever second guessed myself. You know, I've I've had dark moments in my college. There, were, I had dark times in my college career. You know, after my mom passed, where I was just, you know, what am I gonna do? I was I was like an adult, like immediately, you know. And um, but I, I've I've worked with a lot of people who've been supportive. You know, I've seen uh, favoritism and things like that, of course, over the you know over the course of my career but I use it as motivation. Like to me, it's, it motivates me to go, um, you know, even harder to prove, uh, what I, what I, um, what I'm capable of, you know? Yeah. And, um, so it's just like, I let my work speak for itself. Yep. Amen. All right. So let, I, I did want to talk a little bit about the IDSA. What is it like for the people who are here that don't know, anything about it they're not industrial designers themselves what does the idsa do like what does it afford so idsa so idsa is the industrial designer society of america and we're basically the 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 national um organization for or community for industrial designers mm -hmm. and the the um what we we provide uh content with what's going on uh within the industry um, we work with colleges and universities, and we're also um, working with uh, starting to work with like high school and and middle school uh, age students to introduce them to in industrial design as well. But um, we're, um, I guess you can say, the voice of the industrial design profession um, in the United States, and uh, and it's a it's it's a really uh, you know great network to be a part of, you know. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, I learned, I, um, I landed my first two internships and my first full-time job 
uh, through IDSA and attend the IDSA conferences, you know. So um, with, with the pandemic and everything, we're, we're doing a lot of things uh, virtually. Mm -hmm. um, we're having a lot of uh, a virtual, what we call deep dives. So you, if someone is interested in medical design, they can um, attend a medical deep, deep um, dive for design. Uh, we have women in design, um, which is a, a big thing. Um, and we have, uh, we have just different communities that you can join and be a part of. We call them sections. Um, and then uh, uh, geographically, we have different chapters. So there's a, a New York chapter, there's a Texas chapter or a Dallas chapter. And then we're, we're moving away from state chapters now and going to more localized city-based chapters right. um, to, to continue to build on the, the community. But um, we're, you know, we, we've been going for, for a while, um, you know, so it's a, it's a great organization to be a part of. If you want to learn about industrial design and if you're an industrial designer and want to um, be a part of, you know, the network. And, and you're, you're a co-chair of the, the Diversity and Inclusion Council yeah. at the IDSA. So what do you guys do on that? On that? So we, we're working on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We, we focus on, on three areas, you know. So we, we look at education. We're looking at, um, when we say education, we mean, uh, you know, college, the diversity um, within the college environment. We're also looking at mentor programs, working with some mentor programs that are some national programs looking, like I said before, to reach out to um, the high schoolers and middle schoolers to sort of build the pipeline for industrial design for those students like myself who didn't know about industrial design growing up, um, whether you just didn't know, just whether you're in a, an environment where you don't get exposed to it. So we're working on exposing um, kids to industrial design as a career path um, um, because, you know, maybe it can afford them opportunities to do some of the things I've done and, and they'll reach back to their communities and, you know, just each one teach one, you know, it's like uh, the Sankofa thing. Um, but um, the education is one aspect of it. And then we're also um, focusing on the industry aspect of it. So we're working with some major corporations and, and just figuring out how they can better improve their diversity, equity, and inclusion within the designer, de, within their design departments. Um, and then uh, we're also working on it within uh, the industry, like within um, our organization. So how do we provide a diverse lineup of speakers, um, you know, and be more inclusive with our speaker lineups, with our conferences and things like that. And across the board, we're supporting different initiatives, you know, um, on the council, we have um, a wide variety of individuals who come from different communities and different cultures, and we're working to support them and the things they have going on the ground. We have a, just for example, we have an indigenous um, community like out in, in the uh, in the Midwest um, who they're working on, on some things and we're working with them. And it's just, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, and it's just a lot going on with diversity, especially now, you know. And we have been working on things before the uh, pandemic, but it's just like when everything happened with George Floyd, it was just like, you know, it was just like, you know, we got we got to go. And we didn't want to be like, to look like we were following the trend. But of course, it, 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 it looks like that, but we we're actually working on things beforehand. But um, it's a... It's been a, it's been great, you know, working with so many people across the industry and, and just seeing the work that they're putting in place. And it's some, some really great things are going to come out of it. That's, that's excellent. Uh, do you, I mean, since you've, you are in a good position to maybe see how people of color are represented in general in the design world, can you comment on that? Like, what is the, you know, what does that oh. picture look like? The, the, the thing about the design world is that you find that a lot of people, and it goes back to the question you asked um, uh, earlier about second guessing yourself, right? So I feel like, you know, um, just in general, in design within corporations, you have one 
a VP and maybe one or two directors of design, and then you have all these designers, so everybody's shooting for these top two positions to be in leadership positions, right? And if it doesn't happen um, fast enough, they get discouraged and maybe change their career or something like that. And then there's, there's uh, you know, some people just want to design. They don't want to have leadership and management roles, right? So um, I think that uh, the, you know, there, there, um, you know, you see some diversity up top, but again, in today's uh, culture, people, you know, today's society, people are able to just create their own now. Like if nobody's going to give them a shot to be in this leadership role, there, they can create their own. You know, um, uh, there, there, there was a a, a conference um, after George Floyd, uh, where are the black designers and there were like thousands of designers who showed up like, Hey, we're here, you know, we, we've been here, you know, and I, and it's beautiful to see people, um, you know, it, you know, voicing, you know, using their voice to make positive change. And that's the, uh, that's what I feel like you're going to see a lot more of that, not only within design, but within industries, you know, um, within people like, uh, owning their own material, you know, and uh, going back to hip hop, um, you uh, you see uh, Kanye West like signing agreements with Adidas for his shoes, and yeah. you see people like uh, Dr. Dre owning parts of Beats by Dre, and you know people are really into owning you know the rights to their creative um, their creative um, assets now, you know. Uh, and it wasn't like that before, you know, and it's it's becoming so you, you sort of have to bring these people to the table because if you don't, we're going to create our own tables, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I, I, we probably should have opened with this question, but I, I, I for those we, we don't have an industrial design, you know, major at Lehman. We don't have courses in industrial design really per yeah. se. There's nothing that touches on that. Uh, other than like an introduction to three dimensional design where, you know, you would be in, you would be sort of figuring out three dimensional space and how to use it and how to create within it. But for those, for those of the students here and, and anyone that's watching, what is industrial design? I mean, could you, could you kind of like sum it up in your own words, like what it is and what does it mean? Industrial design is solving problems for people uh through product um okay. for the just you know listening to customers listening to issues they have or and sometimes it's it's not even listening it's watching you know it's like uh the famous uh henry ford um saying you know it's like uh if you ask people what they wanted they would have said a faster horse you know so it's it's listening also can include watching people and figuring out ways to solve their problems and make their lives better um, through product. Um, and I, it's a, here's a funny example. Um, when I was in college, uh, you know, um, when, when I was, uh, when I was in college, one of my good friends was from New York. He was, he was from New York city. And, uh, you know, we were total, op we were, we were culturally, we were opposites because I was this, you know, Southern country boy. And he was from like the heart of New York city. Right. And, um, so when I remember when the iPod uh, came out, I, I was like, why would why would um, someone spend so much money, you know, to have all this music or, or whatever, you know? And he was he he explained to me. He said, let me. He said, you know how you like cars, which I I mentioned it a few times before. <laughs> he told me. He said, in New York, we don't have cars, so when we go to work, we we listen to Walkman and the batteries go dead. So now I can carry, you know, a thousand songs with me. So immediately it hit me that when the iPod was created, it instantly had a market of, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 20 million customers just in New York City, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of um, industrial design. You know, it's like identifying opportunities to solve problems for people and improve people's lives, you know? I have one, I think we have time for like one last question here. Uh, uh, this is from the audience. Lehman College doesn't have a design major, but Lehman is very is a very creative community with a strong engineering program, a business program, and an art program in which we, of course, have design classes. 
Can you describe some collaborations you have had and what perspectives beyond design are relevant to the design process and a successful design product? Um, outside, I would just say any anything, any project that you work on where you listen to people, you hear what they're trying to say, and then you solve that problem. I mean, that that's pretty much, you know, the process, you know. Um, and sometimes, not sometimes, most all the times you have to remove yourself and your um, the way you feel about something from it, unless it's for to the benefit of execution, right? So right. The benefit of making it happen, and that can be that even goes to like uh, you know to what we're talking about to like diversity and inclusion. Like the thing you have to do is remove yourself and listen to what people are saying because um, the minute you try to you know discourage what the, the the customer or the client is looking for they may turn a switch off and go somewhere else you know right, if you right. don't want to hear what they're saying it's like hey i'm just gonna go somewhere get it from somewhere else you know but um but i think just just when i when it all the problems that you look to solve in life is basically you hear a lot of people talking about design thinking now right and yeah. uh it's like the the new thing um behind like innovation uh, you yeah. know all the companies were innovative and uh and you know seven years ago now everybody is using design design thinking, thinking. Yeah, yeah and uh it's just something that designers do it's just a, a thought process of hey let me listen first test a few prototypes and yeah. then come up with this and it could be something as simple as trying to figure out what color you want to paint your room right so it's like you start out on Pinterest, looking at different colors that you like. Then you go to Lowe's and look at paint chips and you pick out a few and then you narrow it down to one or three. And then you paint a few swatches on the wall yeah. and you pick the one you like and then you paint the whole wall that way. And that's basically yeah. um, the design process. You know, you do your research on trends, you develop concepts around what you like, you narrow it down. And then you create a few prototypes, you fine tune it, and then you produce it. And that will be painting the picture, so. Cool, yeah, excellent. Claymon, thank you so much for, um, for talking with me today and for talking with all of us. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I hope we can continue this conversation and I'm excited to see, uh, I'm excited to see what bikes you come up with. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. Yeah, um, yeah, you have to. I'll, I'll try to post some. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, follow me on IG, my yeah. you can follow my artwork. Um, I put it, I put it in the chat. My artwork yeah, yeah. is, um, so my artwork is at D Brand Designs, okay. Um, and then my uh, uh, personal where I post some of my fun things is is Clavon with a zero. Um, oh, cool. and uh, yeah, I got hello it. to Dorothy. I see her I uh, D is yeah. coming. So hello D. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, if you want to follow me, um, I'm probably gonna post my uh, post my um, my cholo bike, which is actually um, from like the Hispanic culture on the West Coast with the low riders. So I just built a a a a, a bike around that theme, and I just finished it last week. And I pr I probably post it up today so you guys can see it. But um. Cool. But uh, but yeah. Any, anytime you want to roll up at Lehman with that bike. Um, yeah, I, have, I I'm I'm in contact with a really uh with a guy up there who's in the Harley culture. He's, he calls himself Meatloaf, but you may have seen him riding around New York City. He has a he has like a pinkish Metaflake bike now, but he used to ride a um a Tiffany blue uh, street glide, wow. and uh, with a big wheel on it. And they they featured him in um the Wall Street Journal, and um so. Cool. So he's he's really uh he's a really popular Harley guy in New York City. So although in New York, I mean, it, you look around like any, there's like a hundred people doing crazy things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to stick out in New York, man. It really is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that that's cool, man. Anyway, so th thank you all. Thank you all for having me, and uh, I hope you all uh, 
enjoyed the conversation. Yes, um, very much. Feel feel free to reach out to me or send me a message on IG. Um, I respond. It's so funny. I had a, a some some student that I, I spoke in, in their class a few weeks ago, um, and she DM me and she's like, "Hey, I have a question, and I was wondering if I can call you." And and I was reading the DM. And she was active and I video called her right there and she answered the video. She's like, oh my God, I can't believe you called me. I was like, so what do you want to know? So, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, you, I'm very busy these days, but I'm always open to, you know, speaking with students and, uh, and, um, and, and talking with people because I know that exposure is like the key. And um, I know that um, that's like really big. So yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, this is great. Uh, great. Let's keep the conversation going. We'll, we'll talk soon. And I really appreciate it, Clayma. And thanks again for, for everybody coming out. Okay. Okay. Thank you, All man. Right. Have thanks a great a day. All yeah, right. you too. Bye-bye.